Friends, we are very blessed this morning to have as our preacher of the hour, one of our own, Reverend Andy Call. Reverend Call is the lead pastor of Church of the Savior in Cleveland Heights. He is committed to resourcing and equipping the people of God to live into the kingdom of God through committed discipleship, dynamic faith sharing. He's passionate about preaching. He's passionate about teaching. He's passionate about equipping the laity for the work of ministry. He's passionate about social justice. He has a love for the Lord. He has a full bio in your pre-conference workbook, but most importantly, what we need to know is that he loves Jesus, that he is a child of the living King. So let us prepare our hearts to receive our brother in Christ, the Reverend Andy Call. Good morning, Annual Conference. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is quite a hum. Can you hear that? It is, I don't know if that's the Holy Spirit moving. Hey, that sounds better. Good morning. It is a joy and a privilege to stand before you this morning, as it would be for anyone who gets to bring the Word of God to this wonderful body. It is a, especially a privilege to me because um, in many ways this conference, you all have helped to raise me in the faith. I'm not quite a cradle Methodist. Um, I was a toddler when my parents joined Central United Methodist Church in Wellsville. Um, and then dad was called to ministry um, to serve, began, began serving a three-point charge, Midvale, Newport, and Barnhill uh, one month before my sixth birthday. That was 41 years ago, and I have been attending annual conference, been at Lakeside almost every year since then. Um, grateful for the opportunity to, to be here, and, uh, and I, I love being here because, first of all, Lakeside is just a, a place of renewal and, and energy and life, but also because this is kind of like a family reunion for me, coming back and seeing all the folks that have been so important and so instrumental in my life. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't point out this morning that 41 years happens to be the span of my dad's ministry. Um, he retired last night, and uh, I am so grateful for that. Um, I actually can barely remember a time when my dad wasn't a pastor, uh, and so that's, a, that's kind of a weird thing for me. It's, it is really the passing of an era, but dad, I want you to know, um, I know Jesus because of you. I know a lot of people in this room this morning can say the same thing. Um, but they didn't all get to know you in the way that I have. Um, not only as my pastor who taught me to love Jesus uh, through sermons and being a youth leader, and, but, but also by being my dad, the way that you have lived and loved. And thank you for that. I'm so proud of you. I'm proud to be your son. All right, that's enough of the teary stuff. Let's, let's turn to the... Will you pray with me, please? Ubi caritas et amor Deus ibi est Congregavit nos in unum Christi amor Where there's charity and love, God is there. The love of Christ has gathered us together. Amen. Although it seems like an eternity ago, it was just last fall that we held listening post sessions around our annual conference. Uh, you probably remember those that were about uh, learning about the proposals that were called a way forward. Uh, there were several of them around the conference. I attended three of them, one of which was in New Philadelphia. Now, just in case you're not familiar with the geography of Tuscarawas County, um, I want to share with you that, that Midvale, which is where I spent 10 years growing up, is, is just a few miles outside of New Philadelphia. Um, and then, and then um, Dad moved to Ninth Street Church in Cambridge, which is where I graduated from high school, and he lived there while I was in college. Um, 
and then um, uh, that which is also fairly close. And, and then, then after, after college, I went back and taught high school in New Philadelphia for four years. I attended Dover First United Methodist Church and sang in the choir directed by Ron Barquette, who happens to be our conference choir director this year, doing a great job. Uh, so coming to, to a, a listening post session in New Philadelphia was another one of those family reunion moments for me. Now, some of you were there, and you, and you may remember that about 80 people RSVP'd and said they were going to be there, and, and over 300 actually showed up. That was really interesting, and, and because First United Methodist in New Philly is a great church, they found all the chairs that they needed, everybody had space. And, and you watch as you came in, people were so excited to see each other. They, they loved each other, they were hugging and shaking hands and laughing and, and catching up. There were people in that room I hadn't seen in over two decades, and it was so wonderful to do that. Anyone who was a, even a casual observer would say, look at how those Methodists love each other. Look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Well, it was. Um, and yet then, as the meeting progressed, and we learned more about the proposals, and we began to express opinions, it was pretty clear that our opinions were not the same. And as that meeting progressed, those faces that were once bright with joy suddenly were sullen and downcast. The lightness of step with which we had entered that room turned into a applauding dirge back to the parking lot. A few words were exchanged, if any, let alone affirmation or hope. I, looking back, I, I think we had our priorities reversed, church. You see, our fellowship gave way to division. But I wonder what would have happened if instead our division had given way to fellowship. What if we had expressed our opinions and said, you know what, I, I don't think I agree with you. But I love you, I know you, I have respect for you. I think we're going to have to keep working on this. Or maybe we're just going to have to remember that we don't agree and yet we love each other. What would it have looked like if we had done that? What would the church look like today if we had remembered that we are called together even in the midst of our difference? In fact, I believe our difference is part of why we're called together. That leads me to wonder, a question that's been on my mind a lot the last several months, it's probably been on your mind too. Is there a case to be made for unity in the United Methodist Church at such a time as this? That's the question I want to spend the next few moments Exploring. In the first half of the 17th century, Central Europe was in turmoil. Regional conflict between Roman Catholics and Protestants soon spilled over into, into conflict that, that, that took over the entire continent. It became known as what we now call the Thirty Years' War. See, it started out as, a, as ostensibly a religious conflict, but like most wars do, as it raged on, people sort of forgot what the roots were. By the time it was over, eight million people were dead. It was during this time that a peacemaking Lutheran theologian and educator named Rupertus Meldenius offered some words of guidance that he hoped would be a roadmap for future religious disagreement. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Now, you've probably heard that statement before, probably heard it quoted, maybe even used it yourself, may not know where it came from, but that was, that's where it started. And I wonder, what would it mean for us to use that as our guiding principle now in the church? In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Now, the statement itself begs the question, what are the essentials and the non-essentials? And on this, faithful Christians disagree. But, you know, we sometimes we spend so much energy on the first two parts of the equation that we forget the third part. We spend so much time arguing about the essentials and the non-essentials that we forget we are to be charitable with one another. Colossians 3, 13 and 14 says, Be tolerant with each other, and if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And over all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. 
And Paul reminds us in the great 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, now faith, hope, and love remain, and the greatest of these is... I have the privilege of serving as pastor of a very diverse church. We are black and white and lots of other races too. We are, we're wealthy and poor, highly educated and minimally educated, gay and straight, Republican and Democrat, and just about every other dividing line you can imagine. Now we look a little different than our annual conference gathering looks, but in many ways the diversity we experience at Church of the Savior is indicative of the diversity all across our annual conference. And it's one thing to value diversity. It's another thing to live with it and to embrace it. I've learned some things from you and from my congregation about our diversity, and, and some of those things I'd like to share with you this morning. Now, as a general rule, I, I'd like to pref I, I prefer to avoid labeling people or putting uh, generalizations on people, but I, bear with me for a moment because I'm going to do just that this morning, but I think you'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. Traditionalists or conservatives have often been portrayed as hateful, rigid, judgmental, and indifferent to the suffering and pain caused to LGBTQ persons. But my experience with most conservative-leaning folks that I'm in relationship with is not that at all. They're not hateful. They're genuinely interested in the well-being of all people, including our LGBTQ siblings. They tend to believe that the Bible teaches that being involved in a same-sex relationship is wrong, and they take that seriously because they take the Bible seriously. Covenant is critically important, and they feel betrayed by people who they perceive violate that covenant. Their opposition to marriage and ordination of gay and lesbian people is born out of a desire for scriptural fidelity and hope of salvation for everyone. Now, you don't have to agree with that, but you should at least understand where they're coming from. Progressives or liberals have, have often been portrayed as self-indulgent, disrespectful, morally relative, and hostile to the covenant that binds us together. But that's not been my experience with most progressive-leaning folks I know. I know them to, to value our covenant promises, but to maintain a higher loyalty. They believe that sexual orientation is part of God's intended order, not a choice. They also love Scripture, studying it and taking it seriously, though they may come to different conclusions about what various passages mean. Being fully inclusive for them is a matter of justice, guided by God's commandments that supersedes our discipline. Again, you don't have to agree, but you should at least understand where they're coming from. Unfortunately, what's missing from too many of our conversations, friends, is the humility to consider the possibility that others might have some truth to offer to us. The possibility that perhaps we should be less certain about our rightness. N.T. Wright says, with all the variety of Christian opinions and, and doctrine in the world, we can't all be right, but, he says, we could all be wrong. Well, that's a sobering thought, isn't it? It also might explain why unity is so elusive for the people who follow Christ. Richard Rohr says that our inability to create unity is a byproduct of our dualistic thinking. We divide reality into binary opposites and do most of our thinking within our chosen frame. What we call thinking then, according to Rohr, is merely a choosing of sides. What passes for really good thinking is little more than devising a strong argument for our side's superiority over against the other. A study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences explored the political conflict between American Republicans and Democrats in comparison to the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians in the Middle East. Think about that for a moment. They discovered what they refer to as motive attribution asymmetry. That's a mouthful. Motive attribution asymmetry. Essentially, the, 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 the motives we assign, the motives we attribute, are, are out of alignment. And the, the, it goes like this. If whatever opinion the people have in their in-group, their own particular group, they believe is motivated by love for the people in their in-group more than by their dislike or hatred for people in the out group. But at the same time, they perceive that people in the other group 
are more motivated by hatred for the people in their group than they are for love for their own group. Does that make sense? That's kind of a little double talk. Let me put it to you another way. If I'm one of those people, and I probably am, uh, I, I believe that whatever opinions I have formed are motivated by love that I have for me and for the people around me. And I believe that people who are different from me dislike me more than they love the people in their own group. And you can see where that creates a problem. How likely are we to, to want to reach compromise or to listen to each other? See, if, I've, if I believe that my position is right and that I'm motivated by love and that other people are wrong and they're motivated by hatred, then not only do I believe their opinion to be wrong, but I believe it to be morally wrong. And if I have made that conclusion, what's the likelihood I'm going to listen to those folks? It's no wonder, according to another study by the University of Southern California, Americans are more divided now than at any time in our nation's history since the Civil War. Several months ago, I was challenged to offer a definition of unity in the church. It was suggested to me by the person who, who challenged me that, that unity depended on uniformity of doctrine and belief. Now, I appreciated that challenge, even though I, it didn't seem right to me, but I appreciated the challenge because it made me think more deeply about what I believe. And I've been really challenged to think about what does unity look like in the church and what, how do we begin to define it? I've been helped by the thing that brought me into ministry in the first place, which is music. And so I want to share some musical terms with you this morning. One is a, a term that you probably know already, unison. Unison is, uh, is what happens when people sing or play a musical line, the same line, in the same way, at the same time. And the prayer I started with this morning is a chant. It's a very old chant, maybe as old as the 4th century. And that would have been sung by a gathering of, of faithful adherents, monks, or people who were worshiping together, all singing the same line at the same time. That's unison. We do this in, in some of our songs. We did it with our communion liturgy yesterday. We sing, we, we pray or, or do a litany together in unison. There's another term that you may not know the term, but you know the practice of it. It's called homophony. Homophony means we're singing or playing in the same rhythm, the same things, but now in harmony. And a good example of that is pretty much every hymn that we do. And here, actually, well, let's, let's try a little example of that. Let's sing the doxology this morning. Praise God. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're United Methodists. We sing in four-part harmony. Let's try that again. Praise God. It's almost reason enough for us to stay together, friends. Listen to that. Listen to that. There's a third way. Give yourselves a hand. That was awesome. There's a third way of making music that's called polyphony. And polyphony is a little different. Here, each line is independent, interweaving and crossing one another. I think we have an audio example of this. So here you have inner, in, independent parts interweaving and crossing each other. The same text is being sung, but it's being sung at different times and in different ways, and the, and the result can be stunning. It can, it can open to us new possibilities of meaning and expression. Unison, homophony, polyphony. Each one is beautiful in its own right, but each one remains one unified piece of music, incorporating different voices and different expressions. And I wonder if the same could be true for the church. 
In God's own nature, we find a, a similar example. We have a Trinitarian faith described as God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each has unique manifestations, yet we worship one God, not three. It's central to our faith, friends, to hold diversity and unity in tension. Part of what it means to be Christian. In Ephesians chapter 4, the passage that Ashley read for us this morning, a passage we've been reading and hearing a lot this week, we're reminded to accept each other with love and make an effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit with the peace that ties us together. Can we disagree and still have unity of spirit? I believe that we can. We are reminded there, that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Jesus prayed in the garden that we would be one just as he and the Father are one. In the opening of 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote these words to a church that was in conflict, at least as he did as our present one. Paul wrote, Now I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. And just in case we wondered what that same mind was that Paul was talking about, in the second chapter of Philippians, he makes it clear that he's talking about having the mind of Christ, setting aside ourselves in obedience to our calling and our purpose. That's a whole lot different from the way most people conduct their daily lives. What witness do we offer to the world when we call for separation? Are we reflecting Christ? To me, the second chapter of Ephesians makes the strongest case. Christ has made us one, not through rules, but by his own life poured out for us on the cross. That's, that's Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, and I encourage you to read it when you have a chance. There are far more passages of scripture that speak to unity of the body of Christ than there are verses that say anything about same-sex relationships. That alone should give us pause when considering breaking apart our church. However, we must not achieve unity through coercion. It's not enough for me to say to someone else, I want you here if I try to control the way in which they can be present and if I try to tell them how they are to live. If I'm, if I'm not willing to truly welcome, listen, and strive for understanding, then how much do I really care about that person? How much do I really want to be in a relationship? If we want to be a church that makes space for all to experience the life-changing power of Jesus Christ and the grace of God, we must first commit ourselves to doing no harm, the first of our three simple rules. This isn't about changing minds. If our goal is to change people's minds to be like us, then we have failed. You see, changing minds, changing hearts is, not, is the work of the Holy Spirit, not us. But we should be open to the possibility of change, not just in the people around us, but change within us. That kind of vulnerability that allows the spirit to move in our lives. This is the very heart of the gospel. Think about how Jesus came into the world, not as a powerful conquering hero, but as a naked, defenseless baby, surrendering power and privilege to reveal to us the true power of God made perfect in weakness. That vulnerability opens to us, opens us to the experience of the other, to growth that comes through relationship. Can we embrace that kind of humility? <clears throat> How many of you here this morning, just by show of hands, have taken part in a hands-on mission project, whether serving a meal or building a habitat house or going on a mission trip? Look at that. That's that is wonderful. Now, when you got ready to do that, did you begin by having a theological assessment to make sure everyone on the team agreed? Of course you didn't. Conservatives and progressives, for the most part, swing a hammer the same way. It doesn't matter. We can accomplish much together even if we don't agree on everything. And friends, God has more for us to do together. As a society, we are becoming more tribalized, fearful, and dismissive of one another. 
Will our United Methodist Church become one more tragic example? If we don't change the trajectory we are on as a society, we're headed for a collision course with worldwide conflict. And if you think that's hyperbole, turn on the news and just listen. We cannot overcome the division in our world with reason or with an appeal to human decency. I don't believe we have either in sufficient supply. Where we are can only be changed by the power of Christ. If we're going to reverse the polarization of our society, the church must lead the way, not simply follow the culture and break apart. Our faith in Jesus Christ compels us to break down the walls of division and build connections of peace, compassion, and mutuality. Christina Cleveland asks this question. How much are the people for whom Christ died suffering because we remain paralyzed and divided by our differences when we should be working together as the hands and feet of Jesus in the world? There must be a better and more efficient way to carry out our roles within the mission of God. Surely we can do better. It's not enough to simply go our own way. Just imagine for a moment if that were to happen. Let's say we split and we create two or three separate institutions from what used to be the United Methodist Church. What then? Do we think the people we disagree with are going to disappear? They're still going to be our neighbors. They're still going to be around us. We would simply have dissolved the connection that keeps us in relationship. We might avoid conflict that way, but, but should we? If we cease to hear dissenting voices, how will we ever grow? And are we so naive as to imagine that we won't face another conflict somewhere in the future? And are we going to do the same thing again and again and again? Friends, I believe God expects more of us. If the church cannot lead in bringing people together, no one can. We have a story to share with the world, but if the world sees only bitter strife and, and rejection, it will not hear the gospel. We are people of resurrection faith, not of division. And the Christ, the risen Christ who enters through locked doors can break down the walls we build to resurrect us and make us whole again. We are not all of one mind. We never have been. But we are united in purpose. If you hear nothing else that I say today, please hear this. When Jesus was asked what was required to achieve eternal life, he said, love God and love your neighbor. That's it. It really is that simple. And friends, if we are united in that, we are one. And I believe that we are obligated, I believe that we are obligated to make room for each other in everything else. John Wesley wrote and preached against division in the church that he loved. wonder what he would say to us today. In a treatise entitled A Farther Appeal to Men, he penned these words. If you say we cannot be one because you hold opinions which I cannot believe are true, I answer, believe them true or false, I will not quarrel with you about any opinion. Only see that your heart be right toward God, and you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, that you love your neighbor and walk as your master walked. I desire no more. And he went on to say, I am sick of opinions. I am weary to bear them. My soul hates this frothy food. Isn't that an appetizing description? I hope that's not the special at the patio tonight. <laughs> Give me solid and substantial religion. Give me a humble, gentle lover of God and people. Let my soul be with these Christians, wheresoever they are and whatsoever opinion they are of. Whosoever thus doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Friends, I don't know where the coming weeks and months will take the United Methodist Church. 
But I do not believe God has brought us this far to leave us. We're in God's hands. God's got this. We have been called together for such a time as this. It's not an accident. We need one another. Even in the midst of our differences, we need one another to find the most faithful way forward. In Christ, we are better together. Thanks be to God.